Hello and welcome to the Learning to Face Your Fears from Home Unexpected Benefits and Discoveries webinar. My name is Maureen Johnson, Program Specialist at AUCD. Um, I would like to Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, before I begin, I would like to address a few uh, logistical details before, um, because of the number of participants, you will be muted throughout the call. You can submit questions at any point um, via the chat box. There will be a time for questions at the end. All questions will be read aloud to accommodate all attendees. We have cart captioning available and if you would like to access it, please click the CC button to view subtitles. This webinar is being recorded and will be available um, as an archive following this event, as well as a written transcript. So please join me in welcoming um, the Autism Special Interest Group co-chair, Brian B. Um, as a reminder, this webinar is part of the Autism Acceptance Month series um, hosted by the Autism Special Interest Group. Again, welcome Brian B. Thank you, Maureen, and thank you AUCD folks supporting Autism Acceptance Month webinar series. Again, as Maureen mentioned, I am on the autism spectrum and I have the privilege to serve as the co-chair for the special interest group. Uh, Maureen, would you please show the flyer? What is the special interest group? Hi, <laughs> if I just came on your camera. What is the AUCD's special interest group? That is a great question that we are going to answer next week on Thursday, the 29th at 12 Mountain Time, where I'm at, and at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to do an open house for AUCD's autism special interest group. Coming up shortly will be the link where you can register for that open house as you can see there on the screen. And at the end of this webinar, I will share this again, and we will show you a flyer where you can copy a QR code. Now it is my privilege to introduce one of my colleagues, Dr. Judy Reven, also from the University of Colorado and JFK Partners. Dr. Reven, if I'm dealing with uh, autism spectrum disorder and a young person, and also having some anxiety. Do you have some resources for me? Brian, you've come to the right place. Uh, thanks so much, Brian and Maureen. Uh, we're all really thrilled to be here and uh, excited to present on um, the telehealth issues that we've come across with regard to the Facing Your Fears program. You can see that I'm not in this alone. Uh, we, there are four of us that are gonna be presenting today. I'm gonna get things started and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, two of my colleagues, so Lisa Hayton and Caitlin Middleton, who are going to talk some about getting into the weeds with the telehealth program. And uh, we're going to wrap up our presentation with Robert Murphy, who's a parent and a recent participant with his son in the uh, Facing Your Fears program. So I do need to disclose uh, that I received uh, royalties from the publication of the original clinic-based program. So here's what we're gonna to cover today. Three things. One is we are gonna review what the core components of facing your fears are. Um, we're gonna talk about how we've adapted it uh, for the telehealth delivery. And then as many of you who are probably in the weeds with uh, telehealth as well, you know that there are some things that are going really well and some things that might be challenging and we're gonna share those things for ourselves as well. So before we kind of get into what this program is, let's talk about why we wanna work with our youth with ISD and anxiety. There are several main reasons for this. One is uh, it's very common. And I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone on this call uh, has a good understanding about that, is that uh, there are really just high rates of prevalence in children and teens with anxiety and autism. Um, you also may know that uh, when anxiety is part of the picture, um, it can be really interfering. That means it can affect us. If we go to school, it can affect us in our school day. It can affect us at home. It can affect us at work, in the community. Um, and so it can be really problematic. But the most encouraging piece about all this, of course, is the strong potential to treat. And we know this through various studies in the neurotypical population where 
um, uh, CBT interventions have been really effective at reducing anxiety symptoms. And we know that in the work on modifying CBT for our population, it's also been successful. So we, we need to go after it. So what is the real world impact of anxiety? Well, I could probably talk about this for a long time, but some of the main things I wanna say are that here's the common fears that, um, that many of our kids might experience. Um, problems using public restrooms for all kinds of reasons. Um, it isn't just about germs or just around other people. It could be the noises and other kinds of stimulation, the automatic uh, um, hand dryers and uh, toilets flushing, I think can be really um, anxiety provoking for some folks. Um, fears of being late, uh, late to school, late to appointments, um, problems with the dark or other kinds of specific fears or phobias. Uh, social fears and anxieties could be talking to new people, asking for help, talking to your teacher, starting a conversation with a peer. Um, we've got many of those. Um, problems just with separation. So parents leaving to go errands. Sometimes it's even just leaving to go from one floor of the house to another floor of the house or to go from one room to another room without their parents. Um, Problems with uh, making mistakes or fear that they will make mistakes, fears that there could be failure, school failure, um, some challenges accepting criticism and feedback and worry that that will happen. And then again, other kinds of fears and phobias. And this is really just a sampling, um, but it's to give you a general idea about the kinds of uh, challenges that our folks come to, the, come to us with and, um, and where we might wanna start. You know, I, I thought a little bit about, well, what is, did this look any different uh, in the virtual world? And you can see there's similarities. There's still some social challenges. Um, it might look a little different because it might mean having to write in a chat or having to unmute and have to speak out loud. Um, but we've also come across kids who have trouble and fears that they're gonna lose internet. Um, I, I, I have that fear too, actually, but the way that I've seen it come up uh, has been where, um, Kids are log on to their school, they're afraid they're gonna lose internet. And then when they log back on, they'll have missed something important, which again, might affect school performance. Um, some kids might have challenges keeping their video on and being in front of the camera when they're doing Zoom work. Um, again, the social fears, as I said, and some of the kind of generalized worry about making mistakes and failure. And then there are some kids, of course, who have some more worries and concerns about just getting sick and getting COVID. So all of that to say, um, what do we know about the best practice intervention, psychosocial intervention for people that have interfering anxiety? Well, we know it to be CBT and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about what is CBT, but you can see here that I've laid out what do we mean by cognitive behavior therapy for the treatment of anxiety, just in, in anyone, not necessarily specific to ASD. We know that the components are based of psychoeducation um, which means talking a little bit about what anxiety symptoms might look like and then working on coping strategies. So somatic management is managing your body's reaction. We pay attention to what it is that people are telling themselves. We want people to face fears a little at a time and that is the graded exposure piece. And we spend some time talking with folks about now that you've learned all of your good coping skills and strategies, um, how are you gonna put them into use even six weeks from now, three months from now and so on. So the Facing Your Fears program, Patch, we've been working on this for a long time. I think we published one of our first papers in the early 2000s, um, but you can see it's modeled very much on CBT. It is a CBT program. It's 14 weeks. This is the clinic-based program I'm talking about now, an hour and a half each, each time. Um, we have kids come with their parents and they're there for the duration. And again, this is the clinic-based program. Um, Sometimes we meet with kids alone and parents alone in, in groups that are occurring at the same time. Sometimes parents and kids work together in dyads and then large group activities. You can see the Facing Your Fears program is broken just like other CBT programs into two chunks. The first chunk is psychoeducation where again, we talk about what I was just referring to earlier, which is defining what anxiety might look like, helping our kids identify what coping strategies they can use to manage anxiety and introducing this idea of facing fears. We also help kids work on some emotion regulation so that when they experience intensity of emotion, they have strategies for how to bring themselves back down. The last seven weeks of the program is all about facing fears um, actively in group. 
So when we first developed the program, it was important to us to have a good research bent and to get some, um, some data behind it. And so this is just a sampling of some of our early work in trying to establish the initial um, efficacy and then ultimately effectiveness of the intervention. And happy to provide more references if people are interested. But one of the things we learned about doing a clinic-based program is that there are so many access issues. Uh, families and communities uh, that live in rural parts of our state, um, families who are on long wait lists, who maybe can't get to a clinic for whatever reason, related to travel, related to childcare, related to time off. Um, and we felt like we were really only able to allow access for a very small group of the population who needed this kind of work. So prior to COVID, this, this program, um, uh, we raised this idea of could we do a telehealth um, intervention or telehealth version of Facing Your Fears, probably six, seven, eight years ago, something like that with some of our initial conversations. And the solution is, is, was really trying to address the limitations that I just referenced, is that maybe you don't need as many people to even run a group. Maybe you can reach people from rural parts of our state. Um, maybe uh, families don't have to worry about transportation, time away from work, and all those things that I think we're all reaping the benefits of right now that maybe hadn't occurred to us quite as much prior to, um, to the pandemic. So it was raised. And um, hold on. Um, so as we think about uh, uh, the telehealth, we have to um, understand, well, if you're gonna adapt an evidence-based intervention, you wanna make sure that you're balancing the treatment fidelity uh, with adaptation. So you wanna make sure that you're still keeping the core components of the intervention. So that's something that's important to us. But we also recognize that with any evidence-based intervention, you, um, you know you're gonna have to adapt. And we, we want to adapt it so that our programs and interventions can be sustainable across context and across time. So we were introducing this idea of adaptation again prior to the pandemic. And our colleague and friend Susan Hepburn led the effort to, um, to really examine, could we do a telehealth version of Facing Your Fears? And again, you can see this was published five years ago. And in that initial treatment trial, we learned an awful lot of things. We didn't have reliable internet like we do now with many of our communities, and we didn't have a good platform like Zoom. We used some other platforms that I think had their own sets of challenges, but nonetheless, we were able to see very good fidelity to the intervention, good completion, satisfaction with the program, and also reductions um, in anxiety symptoms. So for us, it really felt like, okay, maybe we're, we're onto something here. Um, parents felt good about it, and, um, and you know, we're kind of excited. But unfortunately, what happened after that first version is it kind of sat on the shelf. Um, and then we picked it up again, because in the last year or so, we've all been experiencing um, the effect of a pandemic. And so we needed to revisit that telehealth version, see what other kinds of additional adaptations we needed to make um, uh, to be ready for, for 2020 and 2021. So this is where I think I pass it over to Lisa. Yep. Thanks, Judy. So as our clinic team thought about transitioning from in-person to telehealth, um, we really wanted to be thoughtful about the changes that we made. We knew that we'd have to make some changes to the program, um, and we wanted to be thoughtful about it. So um, the CDC, fortunately, offers this really nice way to think about making changes to an evidence-based program by sorting those changes into three categories. So green light adaptations are safe and encouraged, go ahead and do them. Those are the tweaks that you need to make in order for a program to fit a different age group or culture or setting. Yellow light adaptations are ones that you wanna be really thoughtful and cautious about because they may impact the outcomes. So things like changing the session order, it may be okay, but perhaps there is something really meaningful or valuable about delivering information in a particular order. So you really wanna be thoughtful and cautious about that. Red light adaptations, we really wanna to try to avoid because there is a higher likelihood that it's going to impact the outcome. So this is things like reduced dosage of a treatment or eliminating activities altogether. I'll take the next one, Judy, thanks. 
So I'm not gonna walk you through every little change that we made because we don't have time to, and it might not be that interesting, but I do wanna give you a sample of some of the changes that we made so that you have insight into how we thought about making this adaptation. So a couple of examples. Um, in the Facing Your Fears original in-person group, the session is designed to be 90 minutes long. In the telehealth version, it's 75 minutes, and we consider that a green light adaptation. And if you were paying attention a slide ago, you would say, wait, Lisa, but that looks like a decreased dose of a treatment. Isn't that a red light? We paused and thought about that too, but really when we're in person, we spend a several minutes walking from the place where families check in to the group room. And then when parents transition to the parent group, that's another few minutes we spend walking down the hall. And when kids come in, they get snacks and they crinkle their bags and we don't really get going. So that loss of 15 minutes is really a lot of the transition time that happens when we're meeting in person. Another example of a, a change that we thought was a green light change is how we deliver rewards. So in person, we provide stickers and prizes um, to, to the participants in session each week. And that was just sort of impractical to do by telehealth, but we use the chat for that purpose. So while one of us is leading the discussion or leading um, a teaching about a particular skill, the other group leader is in the chat differentially reinforcing our participants who are sitting quietly or waiting their turn or saying something brave. Um, and there is this sort of public celebration that happens for those positives. You'll see here that there's a session format change that doesn't have a dot next to it because I'm gonna talk about it in a couple of slides. So let's just bookmark that and I'll come back to it in a bit. So these are all the delivery and format changes or many of them that we made. Um, and now let's shift to talking about content. Um, again, just as Judy said, the program is, is, is uh, divided in our minds into the first half, which is psychoeducation and the second half, which is exposure and fear facing. Um, we're gonna talk about it in those two chunks too. So here's the changes that we made to psychoeducation, which we largely estimated to be green light changes. Um, again, we're talking about how we identify anxiety, how we externalize anxiety as being something that isn't who we are, but something that occurs in our minds alongside who we are, um, managing our feelings and physiological reactions to anxiety and managing those thoughts. So in the in-person group, these skills are taught through a series of activities and discussions and worksheets. And in the telehealth model, really most of that is preserved. We send workbooks to families so that they can use them. They bring them to the group and have them beside them and reference them and use them during the group. Um, and our activities are largely the same. Um, I'm gonna give you an example of a green light activity change that we did and a yellow light activity change that we did. So an example of a green light I think is in the parent group when we're in person at the beginning where we talk about rewards and the importance of rewarding your child for doing these hard things. And as, thinking, as part of thinking about that in the parent workbook, there's this worksheet where parents fill out their ideas for specific things that their child might find rewarding. So favorite foods that they have or privileges or activities or tangible things that they might buy um, that parents fill out in detail so that when it comes time to sort of help their child move forward and their child needs a reward, we have something easy to reference. In the parent group, um, when we meet in person, we discuss this and then parents pull out their workbooks and we all sit around and they fill it out in the group. We felt like doing that by telehealth was sort of a, a waste of this time um, together and that um, we know that families or people have a harder time sitting through a session or a group or meeting by telehealth and they may um, in person. So we said, why don't we assign that for homework instead? So we still do all the setup in terms of talking about rewards. And then we say, fill this out in the coming week and the following week in the parent group, we talk about it. So we really felt like that was just a tweak that had very little, if anything, really nothing lost in terms of what families might get out of the activity. In contrast, there is another activity that we do with kids um, called Worry Bug Helper Bug. And it's part of teaching kids about externalizing anxiety. So again, anxiety is not who you are, it's something happening alongside of you. And one of the ways that we help explore that with kids is by giving them some Play-Doh and having them create their worry bug, which is that thing that tells you the worried thoughts. 
and then create a helper bug, which is the character that might coach you to think more adaptive, um, manageable thoughts. And when we do this in person, it's always like one of our favorite ses sessions and for the kids too. It's fun, it's dynamic, the kids laugh, they have fun showing one another their worry bugs. But we also knew that it would be really hard to do that in session because we, we can't keep the kids' attention for a very long time by telehealth. And if we spent 20 minutes working on this activity, it would be really hard to address the other content that we needed to address in that session. So similar to the parent activity, we sort of set it up at the front end, um, talk about the concepts, tell them how to do the activity, and then we send them to do that activity in the week that follows. And at the next session, they bring their worry bug and helper bug and show it to us. And because this is such a dynamic interactive activity, we thought, you know, this might be a yellow light change that we're making because maybe there is some magic that's lost in terms of transitioning this to a homework assignment instead of doing it all together. And I can report that there's really been variability. There have been groups where this has been just as dynamic as it felt in group, where the kids come the following week and they clearly put a lot of time and effort into their worry bugs and helper bugs and they're super excited about theirs and one another's and it feels very similar to as it did in person. Um, and then there have been groups where kids, you know, drew something on a piece of paper and it felt more maybe half-hearted than um, what would have perhaps happened if we were all in the same room together. Um, and so we kind of tagged that one as a yellow light adaptation. Let's, let's move on. I want you guys to, to, you had some time to look at those. If you have questions about particular changes we made, we can talk about that during the Q&A, but I don't want us to run out of time. And I know that those of you who may be doing therapies um, for anxiety probably want to talk about exposure because it's the thing that we felt most apprehensive about, and I assume that there are others who may feel apprehensive about it. This is the facing your fears a little bit at a time. Um, and I have to say that the fear facing went has gone better than I would have anticipated before doing it. Um, but there have been some changes that we have sometimes had to make that really do fall into that red light category. So when we do this, this group in person, um, there is a portion of each group, about 20 to 30 minutes, where a therapist, a parent, and the child meet in a group, in a smaller group. We kind of break off and they work on facing their individual fears in session. And um, in the telehealth version, we have done this in variable ways, depending on the kids we have, how many kids we have, how many group leaders we have, and the dynamic and the fears that the kids have chosen. In the group we're doing right now, what it looks like actually is very similar to what it looked like in person. We have enough group leaders that we can assign one to each participant and we do breakout rooms. So when it's time to face fears, a group leader goes into a breakout room with the family and they come up with the things that they're gonna practice that day and they do those practices. And I've gotta say also that one of the benefits is that they're practicing in their real life home. Um, and so if a child is afraid of the dark and they're working on facing that fear in their home, there can be some real benefits to that in terms of generalizing to the areas in which it really impacts your life negatively. Um, in other groups, we have not had enough group leaders or, um, again, the group dynamics did not allow it. And we ended up doing a, a model called, that we called kid of the week, which is where one or two kids would choose to be the ones to not choose, would be assigned to be the ones to practice their fear facing in session in front of the rest of the group. So we didn't break into breakout rooms. Um, and the benefit of this is that the children who are not fear facing that day get to really focus on coaching in a more in a more concentrated way, which was really valuable, I thought, um, because they got to hear themselves saying the things that we want them to be saying to themselves. So that was pretty powerful. However, in doing Kid of the Week, each kid gets a lower dose of those in-session practices and parents get a lower dose of the therapist coaching in session, which Made, which is one of those things I just said was a red light um, change, is, is a change in dose. So it's something for us to be thoughtful about and to consider in terms of how we would think about outcomes. 
The other red light change that we made really has to do with that structure that I said I'd come back to before. So in the in-person group, we meet as a large group and then we break into individual families and then come and then um, parents and kids meet separately. And during that time in the kid group, the kids are working on creating a movie for facing your fears um, where they have a script and they have roles that they play and we record them and they put together this, this video where they face a fear of their choosing. It could be fear of making mistakes or fear of spiders or whatever, but they kind of show those steps that you make when you're facing fears. And we really do think that this serves to reinforce those principles. It has a, com it has a component of repetition. It has a component of fun associated with practicing these things. Um, that we think is valuable. And we really just don't have the opportunity to do it by telehealth, in part because we know that the kids that we're working with, really any kids, have a hard time sitting through a really long session um, via telehealth. And so we really try to limit their participation to the first 30 to 40 minutes. So they're losing some content and getting a, a smaller dose and so in that area. So we um, would consider that a red light change. Can we move to the next one? Yeah, great. Um, and before I hand off to Caitlin, I just wanted to share a little bit. We really ha have been able to do many of the same fears in terms of um, the goals that we're bringing in that we were able to do in person. Um, so we have, we've, ha we did, we've done fear of bugs and spiders, fear of the dark, um, contamination and germ fears, fear of making mistakes, fear of talking to new people or starting conversations. Um, and I think, again, at the front end, we were more apprehensive about having to be more selective about the things that we could do by telehealth. And we are thoughtful in the screening process about that. Um, but we have been able to really cover a very similar range of fears by telehealth as we could in person. Great. So now thinking about getting started, um, we first need to, there are some sort of logistic things that we want us, that we want to think about. Um, we need to confirm that the video platform works and is appropriate for telehealth, make sure that we do a test run so everything's working. Um, we need to think about where and when the group will occur, privacy issues, plans for children, um, other children in the home to not be disruptive. It can be really um, tempting as a participating parent, I think, to, um, to need to um, multitask somewhat. And so we wanna be thoughtful about coaching parents to really put those parameters on the session. Um, we need to make sure that we get their workbooks and other materials to them. Um, during Facing Your Fears, there are these videos that we show to help model what fear facing looks like, and um, we need to make sure that those are working properly. We need to plan for what kids will do when you're meeting with the parents alone. Um, and then finally, to create a clear visual structure, schedule systems. Um, so we do a lot of share screening. We do sometimes, um, like we'll put up a worksheet and then we'll mock up that worksheet together. So to ensure that it isn't just us talking at families and that it feels interacting, interactive. And I think with that, I'm gonna pass to Dr. Middleton. Yeah, so we're going to talk about the screening process and other additional considerations um, for doing the telehealth program now that we have a few cycles of the group under our belts. Um, and I'll say a thing or two about the screening process first. Um, actually, Lisa, would you mind um, jumping back in here? And Judy, could you yeah. go to the next slide? Would you mind doing this slide, Lisa, on screen? Yeah, not at all. Okay, so when thinking about, about who's appropriate for facing your fears via telehealth, um, there we have put more thought into that screening process because um, the, the screening criteria are similar to some degree. The age range of the kids is the same. The types of um, anxiety that we want to address are similar. Um, but we are more thoughtful about and probably conservative about screening for safety and crisis risks. 
So um, if there is a child who has had previous hospitalizations or who has expressed, you know, when they get really upset, they make comments that they, they're going to hurt themselves or something like that. Um, those are things that typically in person we, we would ask more questions about. And if things seemed that they weren't in crisis in the moment, we'd say, yeah, come on in. And if something comes up, parents have a, a, a more seamless ability to pull us aside and talk to us about those things. Or we pull them into another room. And by telehealth, all of that sort of moving around can be a lot harder. And so we are more conservative about bringing in those concerns because we want to feel confident that we can manage them effective, effectively if they come up. Um, having questions about kids who would do well in a video format, there are some kids who just don't for some of the reasons that Judy mentioned in terms of having specific anxieties around that as well as um, kids who may have some more behavioral challenges. When we're in person, we can often assign a group leader to sort of snuggle up <laughs> with that participant who is having a harder time managing their behavior and work very diligently and uniquely with that child to reinforce um, the behavior we want to see in group. And in the telehealth group, it's really up to parents to do that management. And that can be harder, both because kids can sometimes be them, their hardest selves for their parents, um, and because sometimes um, we're, we're just not able to offer the structure. And then finally, considering a virtual format um, regarding types of worries and graded exposures. So there might be things that are specific, like my child is really worried about um, inserting themselves with their familiar peers at school. Um, and so even if we could create some social exposures in our group format, um, we're, we're not their peers at school. And so if, if, their, if their social fears were not more generalized and really were narrower in scope, then it would be a harder thing for us to address effectively. So we do a more robust screening at the front end. I'll take the next slide, please. If we can actually, Judy, if you wouldn't mind going back a slide, um, I just wanted to say a thing about generalization here. We talked about screening process um, and generalization is also an issue when doing telehealth. You know, when we have our in-person programs, we are in the context of a big hospital. And so we have the luxury of being able to take kids to do exposures and face fears in the cafeteria. We can walk around and go to different rooms in the hospital. Um, and so we can more easily try to generalize some of the skills that they're learning into different contexts. And when kids are at home, we may not have that luxury of generalization, although we can think about generalization in other ways um, because kids are at home and in the real world in more real world contexts. But I think we have to work a little bit harder when kids are at home and facing fears in order to have them generalize to different environments and contexts. Um, and behavior management, I mean, that's one of the biggest things that um, or the biggest challenges that we have in running group in person or over telehealth. And we're going to talk in a moment about some of the most common behavior management challenges or the most common challenges in general with telehealth and solutions about that. But we don't really have the same kinds of tools at our fingertips that we do when we're in person to manage some of those harder behaviors. And we are having to rely more heavily on parents to manage some of the harder behaviors. Reading the room, it's something as clinicians that we do really naturally when we're in person um, and is much harder to do in a telehealth format. Um, there's more interruptions. Reading social cues, knowing when someone's going to say something or jump in is a lot harder. Um, and so that's a tricky thing. And you try to keep that in the back of your mind as you're doing some telehealth programming um, to, to really try to check in and see how kids and families are engaging, how they're understanding the material, if they need more support in different ways. Um, and we'll talk about some of the, the ways we've kind of navigated that. And then building relationships with families and kids and at other levels too, if we have trainees rotating through our group, it's really different in a, vir in a virtual format. Um, and we have to work a little bit harder and create more intentional moments to be able to connect with families and kids um, during a telehealth group. So 
this is not meant to be an exhaustive list of all the challenges that we come across, but some of the ones that we have encountered over and over again. Um, so the first one being kids who refuse to be on screen. This is really common um, and, and tends to, we tend to see it or we have seen it in almost every group that we've done. Um, and so you can go to the next one. There we go. We'll bring it up one at a time. So some of these solutions, this is not exhaustive. You may think of other solutions to try, but some things that we have worked on is being able to go really slow, almost like doing an exposure and facing fears a little bit at a time where we reward small efforts for kids to be on screen for longer and longer periods of time. And we work with parents to encourage their kids to be on screen for longer periods of time, not to reinforce the off-screen behavior, but to get them to be more on screen. Um, kids who are dysregulated in group, that happens in a, in in-person groups and in telehealth. And again, it's harder, I think, to manage in a telehealth format. Um, kids who may be having meltdowns or maybe shut down or uncooperative. Um, and some of the solutions that we've found that work in this, um, for, for this particular challenge is that we've really tried to use those breakout rooms. If we notice that kids are having a hard time, we ask parents privately in like a private chat or something like that, if they would like to go into a breakout room and we can then support them. We can put an individual therapist in there with them to work through that meltdown or whatever it is that's going on. And then we can work again to set up a reward plan or reward system for participation and setting those clear expectations using lots of visual supports so kids know exactly what to expect in the group. Um, another common challenge, you know, parents and kids are at home, they're comfortable, they're in their home routines. And so maybe there's other things going on and parents are, might be making dinner or kids might be watching TV, there might be pets running around in the background that are distracting. Um, so some solutions that we've worked on for this challenge, we try to set those clear expectations right at the beginning of the group. Um, even during the screening process, we'll ask questions like, you know, do you, will you have other distractions like other kids or other family members that are around? Um, and if it continues to be a challenge, again, we use some of those private chat features to send parents a message to say, you know, hey, can you put that aside? Can we help support if your kid is distracted? Um, and, and helping to set up kind of a contingency or reward plan for kids, you know, using a first then strategy. First, you can do this worksheet, then you can do your Pokemon, or you can go pet your dog, whatever it is that's kind of distracting. And then finally, techno technology problems, which is probably the most frustrating and something that we've all dealt with during this time. Um, we really try to determine are these technology problems ongoing? Is it happening every week? Or is it a one-off situation that we can kind of troubleshoot? Do we need to get te more tech support involved through our hospital system or something like that? And then really working with parents to troubleshoot. Um, and some of this is also done during the screening process, trying to understand parents' access to technology. Um, what we have really found, you know, we've talked about challenges and there are challenges just like there are with any, with doing any evidence-based treatment in person. Um, but what we've really found is there are so many silver linings. Um, the biggest one being that families are being given access to evidence-based practices during a very stressful time, during a pandemic, um, during a time that has been hard on all of us. Um, families that live far away, I know Judy mentioned the more rural families that are in our state that may not have access to this treatment. Um, and then for families where there are multiple children, there's work schedules that are hard, parents working really late, and they can't drive across town or sit in traffic for an hour to get to a clinic-based program. Um, I know I talked about challenges with generalization, but it also is a benefit that kids are getting to practice these fears and these skills in a real world setting at home and in, when they go to the playground or in the community, um, they have more opportunity to do that. 
Um, and then I really feel like the, the, the telehealth program offers more flexibility, not just with the childcare piece and travel piece, but also in being more, getting more creative in how we do some of the things that we do in the group. We use other forms of communication that we would not necessarily use in an in-person group. We use emoji reactions. We use chat features and polls to really get kids and parents engaged. So I'm just going to wrap up here and then we are going to hear from our parent um, who's participating today. Um, but just to send you home with these take home messages, um, we know that anxiety is really common in kids with autism and that facing your fears is an evidence based effective approach in treating anxiety in kids with ASD. And this program started as a clinic based program, um, but we have identified access issues and difficulties with families accessing care and telehealth delivery is really one approach um, that can address those access issues. But when we're thinking about adapting a treatment like facing your fears to a telehealth format, we have to be thoughtful and careful about what we adapt and what we change. And we really need to maintain those core components so that the benefits continue long-term. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Reven and Robert for our parent perspective. All right, thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin and Lisa both. Um, so that's, that is the content of the program. And now, um, now we really wanna hear from Robert. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, Robert has had personal experience with, with the program um, and really can provide some good insights into benefits and also continued challenges around telehealth. So before we get any further though, Robert, if you could just do a brief introduction of uh, who you are and your son. Yes, uh, I'm Robert Murphy and my son, uh, Sam, who is on the spectrum is now 14 in uh, middle school going into senior high school, which is are, uh, just baffling to me. Um, and he has a, just an undertone of uh, anxiety. And that's what really brought us into the something that we wanted to get a resource for him that was not going to limit his ability to to live the life that he's going to have to live or get to live or privilege yeah. to live. right right great so talk to us about what did you like about telehealth yeah so i had the best of both worlds judy where we had uh at least half the program was in person and then half the program turned into telehealth. I was really surprised in how fast and how adaptive the team was. I was expecting it to be much more cumbersome. So what I really liked about the telehealth was that it gave my, my son's reward was that he really liked the social bringing people into his storyline kind of thing. And um, he was able to do that more readily when we were in our house. Um, he has backyard chickens. A therapist expressed that they were actually interested in the chickens and he would showcase the chickens and do a little bit of teaching during a show and tell. And that made it, that, that signified to me that he was engaged more during that thing, that time. I also liked that I didn't have to commute. My commute across town was at rush hour. So a commute that would normally take 15 minutes was now 45 unless I hit traffic and that would be about an hour. So I had to plan that. And then it was right around dinner time as well. So it was just the, it was, it was pretty much a three hour commitment um, because of the commute. Sorry about that. Okay. So talk to us though. So, so I hear some of the benefits and we certainly have heard families talk to us about similar sorts of things, but we also do want to hear like what's hard about it. Like we have our own sort of view of what we think is hard, but I'd love to hear what you think was hard about the telehealth modality. Um, I think what was really hard in particular with my son is because he has always seen video as entertainment. He did a lot of recording of himself making various sounds on the iPad, which we have years of that, which is kind of cute to look back, but it was pretty annoying during the time. And then um, he, 
usually uses a screen for entertainment. And to, to be honest with you, we give him a screen when we just need a break. So I was uh, concerned about that. What I did like, one of the other benefits is that I could mute him. My, my son is a uh, interrupter often with his thread of uh, uh, storyline and not really engaged there. So that was another benefit. Um, I, I like, I, it's interesting how the shorter time I did not realize until I saw um, Lisa's presentation that it was a shorter time because I felt like it was a fulfilled time. So um, that's something that was, that was intriguing as well. So if you had to, so I love that you actually had the experience of both. So that you had the in-person, you had telehealth, but you know, sort of in the future as you think about, because you know, lots of us are talking about telehealth is here to stay. We're going to be thinking about it, whether it's for facing your fears or for other interventions or other kinds of uh, so programs. So, um, uh, do you have strong feelings? It doesn't even have to be about facing your fears. Uh, in-person versus telehealth. It, it was interesting um, because thinking about this, if it was internal medicine and I was meeting with my doctor, I'd have no problem meeting in telehealth. I think because it's psychology and all that kind of stuff, I, I have traditionally had exposure and I think we all have through the sessions, through being one-on-one. -on -one. So I question whether or not, especially in a room dynamic, I think there's a lot of intuitiveness that comes through um, being in person and being able to, I guess, allow the heart exposure and vulnerability at that time, which can be easily turned on and off in, I think, a, a, a um, telehealth session where I may just cover it with a sneeze or something like that. Um, so I think if I was to do it, I would want to have an established relationship with a the therapist first, and then I would be okay with planned sessions going telehealth. So um, if I was in a rural setting and I wanted access to this and I just kind of accepted that I don't have the resource within the community or my style, it would change. That would totally change it. I think another thing that I would think in the city too, if it was in-person versus telehealth, and they were an apples to apples as far as the financial commitment, I would probably say, well, the in-person is, I'm gonna get bigger bang for the buck. So it has a perceived higher value, whether or not it's true, but that's my perception. So it's like, if I was to go into in telehealth, I probably would be able to buy into that more if there was a perception value difference. I appreciate those comments uh, and, and the value of the relationship in making a decision about telehealth. I appreciate that. Is there, you may have already addressed this. I just have one last question and then we'll take questions from the group. And that is, is there a time that you just say no telehealth? That you just say, you know, I just, this is not gonna work for me or for my family? Um, I, I, I would say that it would be when working with psychologists especially a one-on-one -on -one psychologist if there was not an established rapport and if there wasn't um, an opportunity to be in person at times, then I would probably not go there. Uh, mm -hmm. because it would be very hard because there's a lot of the dance that happens between a client and the psychologist, mostly by the client's design. So there has to be an openness to vulnerability. And I think that the practitioner would have to get really creative about how you can facilitate creating vulnerable opportunities through a mm -hmm. uh, distance, I guess, even though it feels intimate because we're face to face, mm -hmm. um, there is a distance that we're both aware of. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I mean, you're really speaking to the importance of the relationship, not just about content, so of content of, of in intervention. So that, that's really super helpful. Um, so with that, you know, we have a few minutes and I'm going to invite the other presenters to turn their uh, videos back on and I have not looked at the chat yet so I don't know if other folks have looked at it. Um, but maybe uh, I don't know if while we're looking at it Maureen if there's uh, some questions that you have 
kind of earmark that you'd like to pose to us as we kind of look at the um, at the chat? Sure, uh, Judy, I'm, um, please feel free to uh, put questions in the chat box. If you would like to uh, ask your question um, via video, you can raise your hand um, using the feature um, on your webinar console. It should be at the bottom of the screen. But I do see that we have um, Brian B has raised his hand, so I'm just gonna spotlight him and get his question. Hi, this question would be for <clears throat> Dr. Middleton or for others on the team. Thank you all for presenting here today. Uh, so Dr. Middleton, you mentioned intentionally creating some spaces uh, that uh, maybe were natural otherwise. And there's been a lot of emphasis on relationship and rapport just in the conversation just till now. What's one or two examples of intentional spaces for that? Yes. Oh my gosh, Brian, such a good question. Um, so I think pets have been a really nice example. We haven't necessarily been able to control when our dogs are on the screen or maybe a kid walks in the room or another family member is yelling for us or something. And those humanistic moments of saying, you know, yeah, I'm at home too. Um, and calling out in, you know, when we see other, other kids in the group, you know, if they have their cats or their chickens or their dogs, um, and being able to make those connections. Um, I know that my dog often comes into the room and I'll call out and say, you know, hey guys, you wanna meet my dog really quickly? He's kind of, you know, he came in to say hi to you all. And so to create some of that positive interaction and relationship um, as, as we can, as those moments allow. Thank you. I think I heard you say welcome spontaneity. I, that's a great way to put it. We have okay. to be flexible. We have to be spontaneous and just roll with the punches. I'm just, anybody else listening out there might have in their brain the voice I have in mind. Spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Disney reference. Okay, go ahead. Great question. Ryan, I want to share one other piece that we did think about, um, which was the use of show and tell. This was one of those items on my slides that I didn't discuss but was up there. So show and tell is a routine part of facing your fears um, and by design um, in, in part because it's fun and it's a way for kids to find the program engaging but also because it really highlights this sense of you being this whole person and not being something or someone who's consumed by anxiety or I identified by anxiety, but that anxiety is this thing that happens alongside who you are as a human. And in the in-person group, um, we introduce show and tell in session three, and then from session four until the end, every week there's an opportunity for show and tell. And it's always a hoot, even with our 13 year olds who at first think that they're too cool for show and tell. Um, but in, in this group, we, in the telehealth group, we knew that building relationships was going to be a, something that we had to be more deliberate about. And so we introduced show and tell at session one, and we tell them from the get-go, next, starting next week, you're going to have a chance to bring us your favorite stuff, your pets, your hatchimals, whatever it is, to, to talk about, show about. Um, and it's an opportunity to kind of build some of those connections earlier on. And I will remember for the rest of my life, one of our groups where a kid mentioned um, his, he showed a drawing of an interest in airplanes and all four boys in the group were like, ah, I love airplanes and got into this whole conversation about all of the very specific aspects of aviation that they know a lot more about than I do. Um, and it was such a wonderful opportunity for that kind of group congealing to happen. Um, so that's another example of something that we do to, to sort of build community. Thank you. I, I like that example, uh, Lisa, especially for the older kids, because I know when I consult with other groups who are doing this program with kind of the young teens, they they say, show and tell, that's so young. And I was like, okay, we're not going to call it show and tell. We're going to just call it show off time because everybody wants to show off. And I think what you just described was showing off in, a, in, a, in the best way. So, so I really enjoy that. Um, I was gonna answer the question, someone had a question in the chat about, is there a central place to find listings of current Facing Affairs providers in a particular area? You know, we've thought about that over the years because uh, we've done a tremendous amount of trainings in the US and Canada. 
and have just not kept that list. What I would suggest if you are looking for folks is shoot me an email and I'll, I'll give you some ideas about um, places that we've trained. If, um, if there are folks that are not specifically trained in facing your fears, you'd wanna find someone who had good training in, um, in CBT and um, CBT and, and um, ASD in particular, but it could be a good mental health provider who knows CBT for anxiety could, could work really well, but shoot me an email and I, I'll see if I can be helpful. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. I know I do wanna leave a, a few minutes for Brian, but um, did, did, did I miss anything or we're, it looks like we're probably pretty good in terms of our questions. Yes, I think we're good. I don't see any other questions, but we, um, we do have time for a couple more. So um, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. You can also um, raise your hand and I can um, spotlight you so you can tell your video, so you can tell your question over video. Uh, I've also put the email contacts of um, Dr. Reven, um, Dr. Hayuton, and Dr. Middleton uh, in the chat as well for those that want to uh, connect with them after the presentation. Well, we're in our final few minutes. I'm a fan. Yes, uh, Jolene, just put in the chat. Uh, thank you all. Please join me if you have your reactions. You can use your uh, clap emoji. We talked earlier about telehealth, right, and interacting. So please join me in thanking our presenters again for being here today. This presentation today was brought to you by, yeah, look at all those claps going on there was brought to you by AUCD's Autism Special Interest Group. What is the Autism SIG? Come find out at the Autism Open House, which is next week on Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. The link to register for that is in the chat. We're gonna talk about the two main things that we do throughout the year in the Autism Special Interest Group. We did an in-person conference, which has now become an online conference in November. And then we do Autism Acceptance Month, April webinars, which is what this is a part of. Come join us, especially stakeholders, people like uh, parents, teachers that might be joining today, listening, that uh, Robert who joined, and even folks like myself, if you live on the autism spectrum or similar. I'm Brian B. And this has been one of the Autism Acceptance April webinars. Come again. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, so again, I really want to thank all of our presenters, Judy, Caitlin, Lisa, and Robert for this wonderful presentation. Again, this presentation was for the Autism Acceptance Month webinar series um, by the Autism Special Interest Group here at AUCD. So this webinar has been recorded and a, the recording and as well as the written transcript will be available shortly after today. Um, so I please um, ask you if you can provide feedback on this webinar. Um, the link is in the survey. This really helps with our uh, technical assistance um, for the AECD network. So again, um, I would like to thank you all again for coming and have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>